All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good good afternoon if you're joining from Europe uh, or elsewhere. Um, welcome to session 18A, Land in the Built Environment, the last day of what's been a great uh, conference so far. Uh, and I don't think this session is going to disappoint. Um, I just note that the session is being recorded, uh, at least most of it. Um, and that, um, you know, we've got a great set of panelists that's building on a prior panel yesterday on land use consciousness, which I wasn't able to get to, but which uh, was looking at the critical impact of art and visual documentation uh, on environmental attitudes um, and policies. Um, this session has got quite a diverse set of presentations uh, across local to regional scales, uh, architecture to regional planning perspectives, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so let's let's just jump right in. Each speaker is going to have 12 minutes. Um, this session is on Zoom, so it's a little bit different than some of the others, which have been on a on a um, live stream. Um, so we all share the same same chat and question and answer uh, boxes. Um, and um, you know, I just enc encourage audience to share the audience to share reactions and questions uh, in that I guess it is in the chat. I don't see a QA and a box. Um, if the speakers have reserved time, um, we'll take questions and comments immediately afterwards. Otherwise, just post your questions in the in the chat. Um, and if they are for a specific panelist, please indicate that. Um, and I, I really encourage everyone to take the opportunity of having cross-cutting discussion across these presentations at the end. So, you know, do think about cross-cutting issues and questions that raise some of the larger uh, points about land use and managed retreat. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, just uh, jump right in and ask our first speaker, uh, Donovan Finn, um, from Stony Brook University to please, uh, you know, open with his presentation on what what would a large um, large scale coastal retreat policy really look like? Fascinating question, Donovan. Please take it away. All right. How's this? Can everyone see? I, of course, am flying blind here. Uh, no, everything look good, I, Richard? Yeah, things look good. I've got your slides up and your and your uh, you're highlighted. Great. So, um, so this work is uh, some work that I've done um, recently with my colleague Gil Jang from Stony Brook, and also my former undergraduate student Jessica Tran, who's starting a um, PhD program at the University of Minnesota uh, this fall. So, our question really. Um, well, we had a group of questions really, but we're really curious, this is an issue really here on the East Coast that's being debated actively uh, every day. Um, as you know, we live in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy and slow onset sea level rise is becoming, even in Republican governed places, something that people can't ignore. So uh, we're really interested in three questions and I'll kind of get to some of the rationale later, but uh, how, what would a, a really an anticipatory managed retreat program large scale uh, retreat program look like? Um, what would it cost? Uh, what would be, in addition to the upfront costs, <clears throat> what would be some of the downturn, down, sorry, downstream sort of long-term costs um, and externalities for the communities in which the retreat happens? And then uh, third is is kind of just more of a, of a planning question is how, how can we start to deal with this, this potential future? So, Sorry, having some Zoom issues here. All right, so the, the place we're talking about today is um, the town of Hempstead. Uh, this is located in, uh, if you can see in the inset map here, New York City is on the, uh, on the west side of this map. Nassau County is the first of the two Long Island counties due, west, uh, due east of New York City. Um, so the edge of Nassau County is actually quite close to JFK Airport. And within, the town of, or within Nassau County, the town of Hempstead is actually the, uh, the, the westernmost town um, town of Hempstead is 142 square miles. It has a population of three quarters of a million. Um, it, given the sort of you know vagaries of the Northeast and how local governments operate, um, counties in New York and towns in um, in many parts of the Northeast have a lot of 
power that are different than townships in the Midwest, say. Um, so the town or township of, uh, of Hempstead has 22 incorporated villages, 34 unincorporated areas, and 18 school districts, which will become important in a minute. Um, uh, Hempstead is the largest township in the US. And if it were a city, uh, which it kind of operates as in some ways, right? It operates as a, as a pretty distinct unit of local government um, above villages, which have a lot less capacity. Um, it would be actually the second largest city in New York State, uh, second only to New York City. <clears throat> uh, Hempstead is also famously home to Levittown, the first you know, sort of large scale suburban post-war development in the United States. Uh, and uh, the rest of the town of Hempstead, you know, follows that model pretty, pretty closely, uh, mostly single family residential. There's some multifamily, but not that much. Um, and you can see uh, just uh, the, the figure below how uh, population really exploded after World War II, a uh, slight dip in the 80s and 90s and has leveled off at about three quarters of a million. Hempstead was hit pretty hard by Superstorm Sandy. Uh, it was not decimated, but it was hit pretty hard, especially along the South Shore. And it's a little hard to see from this image here. This is the inundation map, but you know the the shore is very complex. Um, lots of bays and islands and uh, and little peninsulas. And um, you know it's not a it's not a straight line um, coast by any stretch of the imagination. So in the town of Hempstead, about 1% of the units were severely damaged by, uh, by Sandy and about 11,000 or about 4.5% were, um, had, had some moderate damage. And you can see some images here. And uh, the, I'm hoping that the images on the bottom also show you sort of the range of housing. You know, it's like I said, mostly single family, but really ranging from um, relatively modest 1940s and 50s bungalows up to quite expensive homes. And we'll talk about that in a second. So our first research question is, if we were going to do this, if we were going to really be serious about coastal retreat, how much would it cost up front? And this really comes from a lot of conversations that I've been having uh, around the Northeast where, you know, we talk to planners and they say, well, look, I believe in climate change. I think this is going to happen. And I think we need to start planning for it but I go to my elected officials who I need to get the sign off on this. And they say, unless we're gonna make everybody, all my constituents whole, it's a non-starter, right? So if we start with that, if we start with, and probably that's not how it's gonna happen, but if we started with the question of making every single person whole, what kind of costs are we talking about? So we're just looking at one place to get a sense of that. Um, so what we did is uh, we used um, this from the National Climate Assessment, uh, where they mentioned that uh, relative to the year 2000, sea level rise is very likely to rise one to four feet by the end of the century. So we essentially use NOAA data to create four sea level rise scenarios of one, two, three, and four feet. Uh, we then mapped that onto, um, you know, uh, onto the, the coast uh, of the town of Hempstead. And you can see here uh, with the darker being the one foot inundation, sorry about the leaf blower outside, uh, and the lighter color being uh, four foot inundation. We've outlined school districts here and that'll become important in a second, but you can see here how the school district boundaries um, uh, are you know, very um, you know, kind of complicated and gerrymandered a little bit here on, uh, on Long Island. So just to zoom in to give you some sense of the complexity here, and you'll note that you know, it's not always being right on the coast that makes a place vulnerable. Um, sometimes coastal places are a little higher, sometimes there's a seawall, uh, et cetera. So the, the actual potential future inundation is not always right on the waterfront. Um, so um, so we, we start with the, um, uh, with the inundation, potential inundation in various scenarios of sea level rise. We then tried to couple that with kind of a policy um, scenario. So we used for the starting point, uh, the state's post Sandy uh, home buyout programs. Um, there was there were two different programs. You can read some of the details here. The state ultimately purchased somewhere over 1,200 properties, uh, mostly in Staten Island, in New York City, and in uh, Suffolk County. But the important point is that for both programs, and they use fair market value actually in very different ways in these two in the acquisition and buyout programs. But for both, fair market value was the starting point for both programs. So we just used that as our starting point as well, and. Um, Essentially, what we did was just simply calculating what it would cost to move all of the properties, you know, to 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 remove all of the properties um, 
that are in harm's way um, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the coast. And you can see here under the one foot sea level rise scenario, we're talking about a $3.3 billion project. And that's just to move the, you know, that's just to move people. That doesn't count everything else. And that's not businesses either. We're only looking at homes in this, uh, in this scenario. Uh, down to a four foot sea level rise scenario where we're looking at something like 11 billion. And I did want to point out that if you see the average prices there are uh, somewhat high, a little bit higher uh, than, than what the state paid for Superstorm Sandy recovery. Um, you, you know, we have to remember that while there are modest homes in this area, there are also, you know, four, five, six million dollar coastal homes like the one highlighted on the right. So really, you know, this is a pretty simple question, but I just haven't seen anyone else do it, right? So in one town, in one place, what would be the cost of, you know, moving the the most at risk properties out of way, out of out of the way uh, of sea level rise? probably somewhere between minimum between 3.3 and 11 billion. And that doesn't count all of the other associated costs um, that would come with a coastal retreat program. So our second question is, what are some of the long-term externalities of this? If you moved all these folks, what would happen next? Or what would be some of the issues? So one thing I wanna point out is Nassau County actually opted not to take part. They, they did not wanna be part of the state's post Sandy buyout program. And that's because as it says here, local officials didn't wanna lose the housing stock <clears throat> and even more importantly, the tax revenue. Um, here's another great example. New Jersey is really where this first started to become apparent to me. I would talk to local governments and they would say, just like this mayor does here, um, New Jersey has a program called Blue Acres. That's another buyout program. It's actually predates Superstorm Sandy, but uh, he says, we're not on board with it at all. We stand to lose 9 million in rateables uh, but the state doesn't give a crap. Um, we want to help the taxpayers. Instead, we get another wildlife management area we don't need. So this issue of taxes is really, really critical, I think. So this is just kind of a, uh, an example of what we did here. We, we mapped the, the at-risk parcels. We, we coupled them with uh, data from the assessor's database and compared them to the various taxes. Um, we compared them to the county tax rolls, town taxes. We could not get, or at this point have not gotten enough village um, tax data, it's kind of opaque in the state, um, but we also have some school tax information. So uh, again, here's our, uh, you know, here's our map of the school districts, as you recall. And um, when we looked in the, at the county and town level, the impact, the tax impact on taking these parcels off the tax rolls is pretty minimal, right? 5% and under, which probably, you know, could be absorbed. But when we went to the level of the school district, and you know, I can't get into it here, but the school district is a really important level of sort of local government and taxation on Long Island. Um, you see that the the impacts can actually be fairly um, significant, if you can see from this uh, from this image here. Let me show you a better right, one I here. I just want to let you know you're under two minutes. Okay, great. Um, so you know, we see some districts that have a pretty modest uh, impact, but some of them over 50% of their tax base would be removed from the district if they, um, uh, if the homes in under various scenarios were, were removed from the tax rolls. So, you know, pretty significant uh, impact, 30%, 20% uh, in some of these places as well. So the short answer here is at the hyper-local level. So probably the village, although we haven't got there yet because we need the data, and at the school district level, the effects would be really painful and possibly devastating. Um, the third question is how well is a town prepared? And this is maybe a little bit of a red herring, but um, the town of Hempstead is a place that has never had a comprehensive plan. It has three quarters of a million people. It has an enormous amount of its property on the coast. Um, it has no comprehensive plan. They have a department called planning, but they really don't do planning. Um, they, they spend CDBG money uh, essentially is all they do. The town is built out. There's no capacity to build new, more high capacity residential and absorb any of those folks moving off the coast. So the short version here is they, they are not prepared and have, don't even have a mechanism to prepare to deal with this um, you know, future potential uh, challenge. So lack of long range strategic planning in this particular place, uh, is, is, you know, potentially devastating for them. So here's some uh, quick takeaways, you know, making everyone whole is going to be an insurmountable challenge. Local tax base maintenance is going to require a lot of planning and, um, you know, the way, the way they're going in Hempstead anyway, right now, it, it would not, would not be able to accommodate it. Smaller units of local government would be the most heavily impacted. And I think, you know, just a, as a quick aside, 
more expensive properties really are, would make this type of program even more untenable. And But we all know that those folks have the most ability to recover and self-mitigate. So really thinking through, you know, kind of the, um, the cost uh, issues of, of where we draw the line is going to be another important challenge to a large scale retreat program. Uh, thank you all for your time. Great, Donovan. Thanks so much. That's fascinating. A ton of interesting questions uh, come up for me, and I can see them are already flooding in on the chat. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until um, the end of discussion to uh, get to some of those. Um, Sorry, so, I'm trying to unshare here, but it's my screen just went black for a second. So. Yeah, all right. So while you're working on that, I will um, start to introduce our second speaker, uh, Kelsey Best from Van Vanderbilt University. Um, and she's going to talk on identifying climate gentrification across the East Coast of the United States. So take it really kicking it up a notch in terms of scale. So, uh, Kelsey, I don't know if you have your uh, beginning to see. There we are. I think we're set. Okay, great. Okay. Um, awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey. I'm a PhD candidate at Vanderbilt University. And today I'll be presenting some work on behalf of my graduate pursuit team, which is supported by SUSINC, the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. Um, and I'll be talking about our project to identify climate gentrification across the East Coast of the United States. And we use a machine learning approach. Um, before I dive right in, I do want to briefly um, do a land acknowledgement. I'm calling in from Nashville, Tennessee, which is the original homeland of the Cherokee, Chickasha, and Shawnee nations. Okay, so um, some motivation for this work. As I'm sure most people in, in this conference know, climate gentrification is really this emerging hot topic that's receiving quite a bit of attention in the media. However, the peer-reviewed literature is still emerging um, and I've actually been really excited to see a couple presentations on this subject and some new methods being evolved. Um, but because it's still a fairly new topic, there's definitely limitations in the definitions, the conceptualization, and certainly the data used to operationalize climate gentrification. And of course, more generally, we know, especially in coastal communities, as climate impacts increase, and as well as adaptations um, become more common, it's really important to think about how those impacts and adaptations might interact with housing and socioeconomic inequities. So I want to start with kind of defining our terms. So we began this work by just looking at the general gentrification literature. And up here, I've put the definition of gentrification from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, it, it is important to note there's no one agreed upon definition of gentrification, but generally it's considered a form of neighborhood change where high income groups might be moving into low income areas potentially displacing those low-income residents and resulting in changes to the neighborhood, especially racial and demographic, um, perhaps socioeconomic shifts within the community. Um, so as I mentioned, climate gentrification is still kind of an emerging topic in the literature, but the most frequently cited paper on this topic is by Keenan et al. in 2018. And their definition of climate gentrification is pathways by which climate change could operate to impact geographies and property markets. And in this work, Keenan, um, they propose three distinct pathways for climate gentrification. So that's what you see in the figure here on the right. So the first pathway they propose is called superior investment. And the idea of this pathway is that high income households might move from higher climate vulnerable, vulnerable areas, such as lower elevation areas, into less vulnerable communities, driving up the prices and the property values in those less vulnerable communities. Um, the second mechanism they propose is resilience investment. So this could drive property values up for households that have invested in some kind of resilience infrastructure or adaptation measures, um, perhaps displacing low income households from those regions to areas that are less protected by that infrastructure or adaptation. 
And finally, the third mechanism is a cost burden mechanism, which um, suggests that it's possible that actually the higher income households might be the households that can afford to stay in these um, more climate vulnerable areas, whereas low income households might be forced to move because of high costs of flood insurance, repairs and maintenance. Um, so in this work, um, Keenan et, et al. begin to explore climate gentrification by um, operationalizing flood risk with elevation in Miami-Dade County. And they also look at property values to begin to see how, how elevation might impact changes in property values. So notably, we began to think that this is kind of a limited set of data to begin to explore this complex topic, especially drawing from the the more established gentrification literature, we began to ask, you know, what other indicators could be useful to continue to tease out climate gentrification? So motivated by that question, we use machine learning applied to some existing data sets to identify unique patterns of vulnerability across the East Coast of the United States. So we, we collected data for 51 coastal counties along the East Coast. These counties are um, the counties that are directly facing the Atlantic Ocean. And we drew from a range of publicly available secondary data sets and really decided to focus on including some social vulnerability indicators and housing metrics, as well as a kind of more robust set of environmental data and um, it's important to note that we normalized all of our data by taking each metric as a percent change from the year 2000 to the year 2016. And this is because we were trying to hone in on that gentrification element that's looking at community change over time. Um, the notable exception to this is our FEMA damages, which we took instead as totals over that time period. So you can see with our, our social data, we rely heavily on the CDC's social vulnerability index measures. So we have an index for socioeconomic vulnerability, housing, and a minority index. Um, for our specific housing indicators, we use property values, rent values, available housing units, and eviction rates from eviction lab. Um, finally, for an, our environmental indicators, we look at total storm and flood related FEMA damages. We look at rates of coastal erosion, and we also look at total volumes and costs of beach nourishment. And then in general, we also looked at changes in the total population to get a bigger picture of how the population might be shifting. So we use this data and um, use this data in an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, which allows us to identify um, significant clusters of like data within our observations across all of our variables. And so we chose this method because we noticed that quite a bit of the gentrification literature depends on threshold based methods. So this is where the researcher will define a threshold of change um, only over which a community is eligible to gentrify but there's some known challenges with these threshold-based methods. They're very sensitive to the definition of the threshold. So we um, sought to overcome some of those challenges with this approach. So we ended up using a K-metoids clustering algorithm on our data. And once we tuned the, tuned the algorithm, um, we dropped some of our variables that were correlated, as well as any variables that were not providing us any information or any partitioning across the clusters. Um, we ended up with four distinct clusters. And what you see here is the range of each variable we use across each of the four clusters. Um, the dashed line here is the zero axis. So anything above the zero axis means that that specific metric was increasing over time for that cluster anything below the axis means that that metric was decreasing over time. So now for the fun part, I would say we um, began to then interpret these clusters and think about what they could mean in the real world. So our first cluster is represented by low environmental damages, increasing property values, decreasing housing availability, and shifts towards wealthier and whiter populations. 
So we draw from Keenan and define this cluster as representing superior investment. So investment into less environmentally and climate vulnerably, vulnerable regions. Um, cluster two is kind of the inverse of cluster one, where you have the highest environmental damages, increases across all of our socioeconomic vulnerability measures, and declines in property values. So we take this as kind of the other side of the superior investment coin and call this disinvestment. Um, cluster three is characterized by kind of a steady socioeconomic composition, so not much change over time. Um, increases in our um, total population and decreases in housing vulnerability. So this might be something like affordable development. And then finally, our cluster four was our most mixed cluster, um, but we see increasing socioeconomic vulnerability, increasing property values, but overall declines in population. So we think this could be indicative of something like trapped population where lower um, socioeconomic populations are remaining in these, um, in these locations. So to look at some geographic trends, we mapped our clustering results and um, you can see some very interesting geographic clustering here. Most notably, our disinvestment cluster is very much concentrated in Florida and our trapped population cluster is really um, in the Northeast. So um, to begin to look at some temporal trends of these clusters, then we were actually able to extend our analysis to 2018 due to data availability. Um, and so we repeated the same analysis with that extended timeline. And we see that our cluster characteristics are consistent. So we can interpret them the same way, um, which is convenient for us. Um, and we also saw a a really stark decline in the prevalence of the affordable development cluster. So that went from 12 to six counties and also an increase in the cluster that we call disinvestment from nine to 15 counties. So this is you know, just kind of a brief look at the temporal trends, but a little concerning to us because it might suggest increasing vulnerability across all of our, all of our different areas. So some brief insights from this work. Um, as I mentioned, our results suggest four distinct patterns of combined housing, social, and climate vulnerability along the East Coast. Um, we see some interesting geographic clustering in these results and um, our extended analysis suggests that disinvestment especially might be increasing over time. Um, all this really tells us, I, and I think emphasizes that climate gentrification is a dynamic process and we can expect these community characteristics to be shifting. Um, but in general, it does remain really important to consider how climate change could be interacting with social, social and housing vulnerability. Um, one limitation I want to mention is that this work really doesn't allow us to tease out what climate gentrification is, meaning gentrification driven in part by climate change from what might be just plain old gentrification with climate change occurring in the background. So we're still trying to work on ways to tease out some of those causal mechanisms. Great. Um, yeah. And yeah, you're over time. Oh no, okay. So sorry about that. Um, so future work, we have lots more planned. Um, this is definitely just preliminary, and I just want to thank everyone who has supported us. Great. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Uh, fa fascinating work. Um, and, you know, just uh, the issue of gentrification, um, uh, just so important to be getting our arms around. Um, so we're going to turn next to Fernando Pabon, from, uh, who's an architect uh, and urbanist, um, although I'm not seeing his institution here. Um, and he's coming to us, I think, from Puerto Rico. Uh, and he's going to be talking on the design and implementation of public space as a problem and an opportunity for managed retreat. So Fernando, please take it away. Yep, and we're seeing your presentation just fine. Oh, but you're muted. Oop. 
Thank you for letting me know. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Fernando Pavon, and I will be speaking about architecture and urban design as it relates to managed retreat. Puerto Rico, located in the Caribbean, what we understand as a sort of amphibious te territory uh, with a tropical ecosystem, high exposure to hurricanes, and much construction on the shoreline. We'll see three projects and a final reflection about these uh, regarding uh, construction in this very sensitive area. Louis Mumford, the urban historian, shines light on dynamics of a place like Puerto Rico that underwent very fast development. The greater the expectation of material well-being, the less reconciled would people be to its interruption, and the more widespread the anxiety over its possible withdrawal. So in this field of architecture and urban design, we take the project as a knowledge producer. But what is urbanism? What is urban design? Urbanism is mostly concerned with procedure and technical organization of the city, while urban design is mostly the integration of urbanism, architecture, and landscape design, as coined by former Harvard Dean Jose Luis Cert. Now, there are various misleading narratives that we've had to face in this process. Phrases such as, this place has never flooded before, we need to get the water out as quickly as possible, and so much, are very uh, great obstacles to work uh, with communities. The problem of flooding, coastal flooding, riverine flooding, is a classic problem. But it is also a great opportunity to understand the lessons of the past and imagine the future. There are various moments of inquiry and testing exercises, and this is the general design methodology. A close examination of old cartography, careful documentation and drawing of existing conditions, analysis of new documents looking for patterns, salient features, opportunities, eventually identifying unmet needs, deficits, surpluses, defining requirements, and then gleaning and proposing interventions and examining the adequateness of solutions. So, one of the things that we have to do is study the historical record uh, and the cartography. And we see here the Bay of San Juan and its development over time, over various centuries, and how eventually the wetlands, the mangroves, and even the agricultural lands were overwhelmed by the city. This image now shows all those areas that were filled up to accommodate the urban activities. It is an area of high risk, and it is one of the most uh, heavily populated areas of the island. The urban to rural ratio has significantly shifted during this time from about 60 to 40 to almost completely urban. Now, this first project that I'll talk about is a project that identifies the latent problem, urban pressure over hydrologic space in a spatial basis and proposes a solution in time. Locating the project in the estuary of the Bay of San Juan provides a particular vision of the contemporary tropical city and its associated fragile construction in a sensitive territory. This focuses the operations of design in the key ecological junction between water and land, a reading of the historical settlement process that we just saw and its associated environmental transformation is argued to be among the essential criteria to understand both the needs of the territory and those of its inhabitants. This proposal aims to define and implement public open space in the form of a strategy of renaturalization. This strategy is tested by studying the spatial and temporal effects of the convergence between processes of advance, retreat, and resistance as enacted by urban and environmental conditions. So this is the town of Catano, right on the metropolitan area, and we can see that over the decades, all the mangroves and wetlands were, were filled up by urban activity. When we zoom in on a space like this, we have the chance to engage in urban design. And you can see here the chronology of about 34 years of a project such as what I'll be showing of transformation uh, and all the different areas that need to be uh, put in motion in order to uh, move the project forward. 
So this is more or less how the area is built up today. And this is how slowly carving it would transform it into a renaturalized creek uh, uh, delta and a new waterfront for the community that will also accommodate subsequent stages in sea level rise. But we also have to ask ourselves, where are we going to put all these people that we're moving? So we have to uh, locate parcels of land, ideally as close as possible to their current communities and living areas. This is very much a process uh, that's been begun in another area of town, uh, very more, much more known, uh, known as Caño Martín Peña. And this process would definitely require a transformation of the landscape as well, uh, defining a point of uh, resistance, but also a point of retreat. So some sort of uh, earth movements and earthworks would have to take place. And a great park, a great public space could uh, take the space previously occupied by buildings. So in this sequence, we can see the historical record in this part of town and the future condition that we can imagine. The second project is a project for the San Juan Bay Street program, and it's in a different part of town, much closer to the more affluent areas, but which is currently flooding very often. And this project is mostly based on identifying the hydrological basin of the lagoon of Condado and accommodating, absorbing, diminishing, connecting, resisting, bringing closing, closer nature to human beings, mitigating, extending, remembering what used to be there and preparing for, for the future. So we do a cartography of the natural conditions as they exist there. We examine the uh, historical cartography and we, understand, we attempt to understand the processes that have taken place here. One of the important key findings of this uh, project is that there is a deficit in the capacity for surface storage of approximately 6 million cubic meters of water in the estuary. This deficit, this deficit should be the main point of departure to accommodate flooding in the basin of the estuary of the Bay of San Juan. This is evident from the cartographic examination. In the Candado Lagoon, this deficit is about 46,000 cubic meters of water. So we can see here the transformation, the eventual land reclamation to build a road on the southern side of the lagoon. And the space, as it might be transformed over time, slowly giving back to the water area and space, but also extending the, short, the, the border and, and increasing the width of the border in order to accommodate a better gradient for the ecological functions. Other small interventions around the lagoon will work with the sidewalks and the curb of the street. And also spaces such as uh, parking areas that used to be lagoons in this very widespread estuary, which nowadays flood uh, every so often. In the Candela de Lagoon, there is an impervious surface dedicated to parking of over 112,000 square meters that contribute significantly to runoff, the flooding of adjacent streets, and the pollution of nearby bodies of water. And there's a number of opportunities and challenges that uh, meet at the confluence of, this, uh, of the issues studied in this project. A third project is one based on uh, various waterfronts and communities on the shoreline around the island of Puerto Rico and particularly the town of Boqueron in the southwestern corner of, of the island uh, is uh, the space of study, the object of study. We can see here an old picture from the 1930s that shows how the original extents of the village and the sandy nature of the ground plain. It also shows the dynamic nature of the shoreline most evidently at the place where a creek meets the bay. So we can see the brown surface here, and it was mostly a sandy surface, which could accommodate percolation activities. 
Fernando, about two minutes. Thank you. And this is a project, a series of small plazas opening into the bay. And this particular plaza, I want to show you, there's, we propose a deck to replace an existing concrete slab plaza. And this deck is very slightly, uh, softly put on the ground, just on above uh, concrete masonry units. These are easily removable and replaceable system that will allow both rain and higher tides to percolate into the soil. And this is the end result. Now, one of the challenges we encountered was uh, people were opposed to changing the pavement of the street because it would uh, affect uh, daily commercial activities and whatnot. So eventually, unfortunately, that was not implemented. So flooding in the area of the street has continued, unfortunately. And this is a picture from the effects of Hurricane Maria. Now, a final reflection uh, on my blog is a recent opportunity prompted by some flooding in July of 2020 due to tropical storm Isaias. It has become clearer that perhaps the most fragile yet critical piece of infrastructure might best be described as the combination of wisdom, knowledge, and common sense. Above all, at its encounter with critical thinking, curiosity, intellectual tension, and constant search for the truth or the best approximation of reality, this endeavor might best address our gaps in addressing challenges such as climate change. So these are all uh, maps of Mayagüez, which is just a bit north of Boqueron, which depict how people were very careful to settle in the higher grounds. We have to understand that the coastal plain as a space is a result of a process of thousands of years where various rivers and creeks have periodically flooded and deposited sediment on the landscape. Human settlement takes as a point of departure the recognition of a topology, a process of knowledge construction, starting with the observation where the settlers grew aware of the geological, hydrological, and ecological dynamics taking place in their midst. Reaching a state of understanding and therefore settling in the high grounds was the form in which the settlers took responsibility for their efforts, actions, and legacy. That is, they recognized the risk of settling in areas that periodically flood and made the decision to locate themselves in safe places. This attitude was codified and institutionalized in part of what is known as the laws of the Indies. Great. And this is Fernando, an image I'm, of what that experience was. Yeah, I'm very sorry to be the, the bad cop here, but um, really great presentation. Thank and I think, your time. Thank you very, very much. Really fascinating. And I think, you know, illustrating both some, you know, tremendous creativity about uh, how you reclaim some of the space, but also the need to relocate people, um, which you know we've seen a lot of the discussion in the chat already from the Hempstead case. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing that. Um, we're going to turn now to our next uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, Fernando, if you can stop sharing, um, and that one's on evaluating land use trade-offs on agricultural lands affected by uh, sea level rise. And we're going to have three presenters, Taryn Sadal, um, Jenna Clark, and Christine Miller Hesed, uh, all from the University of Maryland. I'm not sure who's going first, but please take it away. Hi, thank you, Richard. Um, today, my colleagues and I will be talking about our recent NSF funded project regarding land use trade offs on coastal agricultural lands affected by sea level rise. We had originally aimed to have an in-person meeting and several in-person interviews with farmers and woodlot managers who inhabit the areas most vulnerable to sea level rise in the Chesapeake Bay. However, due to the pandemic, we had to shift our focus and go completely virtual. Our goals for this project were to understand the decision-making process of coastal farmers and woodlot managers with regards to their land management options when they were experiencing sea level rise impacts in the Chesapeake Bay area, specifically in Maryland and Virginia. We then quantified our results by utilizing a resist, accept, direct, or RAD framework as developed by Sherman et al. that you might have heard throughout the talks this week, including the plenary talk by A.R. Siders, noting that we realize this is a traditionally used as an ecological framework, but we modified it to use it in the agricultural field. Our definitions of the RAD components are resist or protecting assets, including efforts to prevent agricultural lands 
from flooding and or becoming salty, except or accepting change. This includes allowing lands to become wetter and saltier as it naturally occurs. And finally, direct or transitioning land, which includes facilitating specific land changes toward a desired outcome or scenario, either with native plants or wetlands, recreation, carbon and or other markets or some combination of the, all of them. Our second goal was to identify and determine the areas for expansion in policy and research for these areas based on the participants' priorities and capacities. For our participants, we recruited about 25 Maryland and Virginia farmers and woodlot managers via a network snowball approach through land grant extension, NRCS, and soil and water conservation districts since we didn't have any prior connections. We know that there were participants that we were unable to reach via this method, especially since we are limited to participants that were able to join virtually. Our data collection consisted of conducting an online pre-survey, phone interviews, three 90-minute virtual workshops where we presented information on the topics and allowed for discussion among participants and an online post-survey. To give some context of the impacts of climate change and sea level rise, specifically in the Chesapeake Bay region, as we can see here that Sea level rise and acceleration within the bay is above the global mean. The areas shown represent most of the range of the bay, starting with Baltimore in the north and continuing to Norfolk in the south. Thus, potentially resulting in land loss in the coastal areas as seen between the projections from 2030 to 2050. The red areas are projected areas that will be underwater within that time frame based on mid-level, mid-range sea level projections. Additionally, the region is seeing an increase in nuisance flooding and saltwater intrusion. In our pre-survey, we asked participants to indicate whether they had seen various signs of potential impacts from sea level rise and or climate change on their farms or woodlots. The number of impacts varied between our participants. The impacts that were most frequently seen were soils were wet longer and more standing water was seen on the land, noting that no participants indicated that they saw no impact on their farm or woodlot and that at least 50% of them experienced seven out of 13 impacts. So we know that projections are showing accelerated rates and significant flooding in the near future and that our farmers are seeing impacts. Um, many of those who participated in the workshop reported dramatic change as they have been living on this land for decades. And so given this chronic environmental stressor, we wanted to understand what farmers can do as well as what they want to do. And so we organized the various management strategies as resist, accept, direct. So again, are they trying to continue to plant and harvest by preventing flooding and salt, such as with infrastructure like tide gates? Are they letting their land become wet and salty and working around it or changing to a more tolerant crop? Or are they open to transition to a land use that fits with these conditions like wetland habitat or hunting? We know that government agencies and conservation groups are targeting this vulnerable land to retreat from the coast and become wetland. But again, what do the farmers want and what is feasible to them? So we posed a question on the post survey. Um, basically, what course of action do they want to pursue? And we were curious about the short term and the long term. So you can see um, we asked, we gave them three options. We didn't label them as resist, accept, direct, but they certainly correlate to those um, courses of action. So um, we had a small sample size, but we found the results pretty interesting. Um, I'll present the results by our participant type, starting with our woodlot managers. Um, we had six of them participate. You can see how they um, submitted their answers in the short and long term, and we're also including here the impacts that they reported on the post survey. So our woodlot owners um, reported in the mid range of impacts. And what we found very interesting was that in the long term, they all are choosing to direct. Um, next, we had our small small farmers um, who were able to participate. They primarily grow vegetables or row crops. And these participants are reporting fewer fewer impact scene and generally um, they intend to resist. Finally, we had our larger properties and they primarily grow grains and corn and soybeans. Um, they reported some higher amount of impacts on their land. And this group was less homogeneous in their course of action. But again, if we look in the long term, we see this, we see more movement towards that direct option. 
In this project, we not only wanted to get a sense for how open or resistant coastal farmers are to landscape transformation, we also wanted to understand what motivates them to resist, accept, or direct change, and what kinds of actions they use toward those goals. I'm going to share insights that we gained from qualitative analysis of interview responses and discussions in online workshops. Farmers had many motivations for protecting farmland and woodlots from flooding and saltwater intrusion. In addition to being the source of their livelihood, farmland is intrinsically valued by farmers and is a part of their family and community identity. Some farmers shared with us about the long-term goals they had for their land, uh, such as establishing a vineyard or a community garden. And some farmers described the difficult task of working to address flooding and saltier soils as preferable to the cumbersome process of enrolling the land in conservation easements. Farmers discussed using a variety of management techniques to resist the flooding and salinization of their land. Workshop discussions revealed that farmers' decisions to employ one or more of these techniques depends in large part on the amount of land impacted by flooding and salt, how many entry points the tide has to the land, whether they own or are leasing the farmland, and the age of the farmer and whether or not they expect their kids or grandchildren will want to farm the land. Farmers were motivated to accept the changes on their land, that is neither resist them nor actively direct them for several reasons. First, some farmers spoke of needing to give up and cut losses by allowing land with wet patches to go fallow when machinery got stuck, it became too inefficient to work around oddly shaped wet areas, or they were otherwise unable to make a profit from the impacted land. Other farmers, seeing that wet areas could no longer profitably grow crops, were somewhat interested in how they might receive income from the land in other ways. Yet because they perceived that such programs, such as easements or farm bill programs, limited their autonomy in making decisions about their land, preferred to just allow those areas to be fallow. Some farmers expressed that they had accepted that some areas were going to flood primarily because they did not know what else they could do about it. And these farmers were trying to grow alternative, more salt tolerant crops in those areas. Our analysis suggested that while row crop farmers would generally like to keep as much land in agricultural production as possible, there could be openness to directed transformation of the landscape if the outcome helped to support them financially and allowed them to maintain ownership and a sense of pride in their land. Some farmers spoke specifically of the desire to use the land that could not be profitably farmed as land that contributed toward environmental goals like habitat, capture of nutrients from runoff or carbon storage. Woodlot owners seemed more ready for transformation of the landscape perhaps because the impact of saltwater intrusion on their woodlots is so devastatingly apparent as they transition to stands of dead trees known as ghost forests. There are several management actions that farmers could take that align with directed transformation of the landscape toward tidal wetlands. These include enrolling in farm bill programs that incentivize transition to wetlands, enrolling in conservation easements, and capitalizing on hunting and fishing that can take place on the transitioning land. And we also heard of interest in carbon sequestration and carbon markets if those were to be developed. Great, in two minutes. So I'll wrap up. We overall found this RAD framework to be a successful, viable way for our team to organize the actions and intent of our workshop participants. Uh, we know manage retreat and making space for migrating wetlands would be a direct option um, that agriculture and conservation partners may want to see occur. Um, but in order to possibly direct, we do need to understand the farmer's feelings about staying in place via the resisting or accepting strategies. And so this RAP framework covers that full spectrum. We have some research and collaboration suggestions because as our results show, there is this opportunity to direct in about five years. And it's the responsibility of Sea Grant and other partners to work towards those actions. 
First, we need more research um, to show where saltwater intrusion will occur on properties so that farmers can better prepare. Secondly, we saw several participants who are expecting to change between the short and long term. So policies and programs or funding can help during that transition phase so that farmers can um, maintain their land for um, economically as long as possible, but then allow for a transition when an ecological or economic threshold is met. A good example might be tide gates, a program can help install them, but when those tide gates eventually fail, um, either structurally or due to flood levels, this is the trigger that we might switch to another um, land use. Finally, um, we need to envision more with that direct type of land use would look like and have that continued discussion between policymakers and farmers. Farmers especially need to weigh in on what program design would be most appealing. So as we heard, um, how do we create the best, most appealing easement program for farmers to want to participate in? Um, they do see a lot of potential in carbon markets, but there's also some skepticism about the bureaucracy and the process um, to participate in those markets. So overall, if we want farmers on board, um, we need to continue to listen to them and work to get it right. Uh, so I'll wrap up with a few thank yous. Um, first to NSF who funded this project, as well as the Director of Maryland Sea Grant, Frederica Mosier, who was the principal investigator. We also wanna thank the other co-principal investigators, the steering committee, and certainly most importantly, um, the farmers and woodlot managers who gave us their time. So thank you for listening as well. Yep, thanks so much. Really fascinating to get down to this level of granularity and understanding the motivations that uh, the farmers and woodlot managers would have. Um, so uh, we're now going to hear uh, a, a, our next presentation on decision support uh, for testing managed retreat policies um, from Carolyn Williams at the University of Delaware. And Carolyn, I think we're getting to see your presentation. There you are, you're up and running. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Caroline Williams. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Delaware. I'm uh, working alongside a handful of faculty members at the University of Delaware, Cornell and East Carolina. And I'm going to begin by unpacking uh, the title, uh, a decision support tool for testing managed treat policies. Um, when I'm talking about this component managed retreat policies, um, I'm focusing at this time on flooding, um, ignoring um, wildfire or extreme heat scenarios or other scenarios. I'm also focusing on housing um, and not necessarily incorporating commercial farmlands or other societal impacts or uh, assets. The decision support tool of this is aimed towards federal and state government because my work is at a regional basis, as you'll see. And the framework is, uh, <laughs> this is a work in progress. I'm in the midst of my PhD and by the end of it, hopefully, you know, all of this will be in place. So for flood risk projections, uh, we're aware of uh, plenty of um, flood risk models out there. Um, these are primarily based off of handful components, including fluvial flooding, fluvial flooding, storm surge, as well as climate change impacts, such as uh, sea level rise and intensifying rain. Um, however, with housing projections, it's a little different. We do have population projections, which are quite handy, and land cover uh, projections as well. But housing, it gets a bit more tricky. Uh, that's because there's... Um, many components when it comes to housing dynamics. Of course, it's dependent on the number of people in the area, uh, the type of land in the area. Well, earlier today, we we're talking, or earlier in this session of presentations, there's some talk about taxes as well, and so on. Um, we're also familiar with some of this supply and demand uh, context of housing dynamics. Within this past year, we're seeing Lots of headlines highlighting the housing shortage and we need to build more faster and and so on. And so while generally we can expect an increase in new houses and we're generally expecting increasing in flood risk, how can we prevent uh, new homes to be placed in um, flood prone areas such as depicted in this uh, photo. So when we're talking about 
new houses into the future? I mean, one of the primary, uh, primary questions we need to ask is how many houses? We also need to be thinking about where these houses are likely to go. And then nested within this is what land use mechanisms or land use policies should we use to prevent uh, construction in risky areas or encourage construction in low risk areas. And so for this first piece of what we're calling the housing model, we're trying to predict uh, or project the number of new homes per county at a given time. We're using a handful of uh, data points such as um, population attributes, housing, general demographics, land and proximity values to feed into uh, the number of new houses per county. Uh, this will feed into an allocation model where we will then place this, these houses within a county over a, a sub-county unit area, perhaps a grid. Um, and this grid will be have an assigned allocation weights based off of proximity factors, say proximity to an urban core or roads, investment impact, housing, as well as flood risk and, and land aspects um, to, again, uh, calculate, you could say, these allocation weights. So combining the weights with the um, output from the housing model, we can then do it all over again and recalculate some allocation weights over a series of time steps so that at each time step we have the location of all houses in each county at a given time. Now, uh, this work is inspired by Ga a paper by Gowan O'Neill in 2020. I do recommend checking it out uh, if you're interested in this type of modeling. Um, now nestled within this are uh, the opportunity to investigate land use policies. And so we can investigate um, zoning restrictions marked by these red X's of where we should not build within the county, uh, density bonuses where we should promote uh, building or more high density, and of course like a multi-pronged approach. So uh, I'm in the midst of wrapping up the housing model right now. Um, and the housing model is composed of a thousand counties in states between Delaware and Texas along the coast. I've gathered data um, between 1970 and 2019 when available. The model we're using is an LCM neural network model. And some of the inputs, again, we're incorporating are related to housing and population as well as education, race, uh, vacancy and ownership data, uh, the county's proximity to the coast and percent non-buildable area. And our output is, the, uh, is a 20 year annual net housing projection for the thousand counties in this study. Now this housing model itself could be used uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which could be looking at say housing acceleration so we could look at growth rates over the past 20 years and compare it to uh, projected growth rates for the next 20 years and seeing uh, where we're expecting an acceleration of housing or perhaps a deceleration. So this is one figure that could um, depict this in green areas. This would represent that the future 20 years expecting to have higher growth rate compared to the past 20 years and pink areas would be the opposite. Uh, moving on to the allocation model, um, this work is in progress. And so I'm in the midst of data collection and I don't have too much to say in the allocation model itself. However, while we're framing this up, we're again considering uh, different land use um, policies that we can test. So we can look into, again, zoning, density bonuses, overlay zones, and so on as well as some buyouts or land swaps, lease facts. All of these are sourced from the um, Georgetown Climate Center Managed Retreat Toolkit, which again, I do recommend uh, checking out if you haven't had a chance to. And these first three, uh, I've mentioned them before, they're primarily from a, a right land use regulation standpoint, but we can also explore these last three. However, it's ba largely based off of a household's decision and so to incorporate this decision-making component, we can link it with a decision model as well. So um, here I have yet another figure depicting a 
um, model that was primarily um, built out by my advisor, Rachel Davidson, over the past 10 years or so for a hurricane risk management um, application. And here we have a loss and retrofit model that deals with physical um, aspects interacting with three stakeholder models. Uh, we have homeowners choosing whether or not to buy insurance, insurers choosing what uh, price to set premiums and so on. And we can have the government um, offering like grants for retrofit or for buyouts or so on. So this is how this model itself uh, interacts. And also uh, we're working on linking it with the regional economy. If you do want to check out the basis of this model, uh, you can check out the citation at, at the bottom here. Now, uh, for the housing and allocation model that I was just speaking about, this will fit into this dynamic building inventory piece, which will interact with the, this hazard model, in our case, flooding and related damages. And then again, uh, this will interact with the homeowner, uh, I mean, the stakeholder decision model. The advantage of this is that, um, again, these dynamics are modeled over a series of time steps. In this case, it's uh, annually, so at 20 annual time steps. And so <laughs> ideally, this model can help us answer this question we've been thinking about for the past four, uh, four days. At what point manage your tree? Or at what point should we introduce different policy mechanisms and so on? And so uh, as with any model, I do wanna highlight the limitations and also the opportunities of this um, approach. Of course, we are basing everything off of past data and trends, assuming that past behavior will be similar to future behavior. Uh, this past year, especially in the housing dynamics world has shown us uh, that may not be the case. However, we're uh, limited by the amount of uh, data available. Uh, it's obvious that this is also a top-down approach. And to that degree, it does neglect a people-centered strategy, um, which was very much highlighted at last night's session in the evening, um, session 17C, I believe. And so um, while this is one piece of it from top down, we also do need, it's critical to um, integrate people-centered solutions as well. However, the opportunities is it does support um, some large scale regional planning and discussions. Uh, this was also highlighted at a session yesterday by the host by the Pew Charitable Trust saying that we need large scale regional planning to get these um, managed tree options viable. Um, this model also can incorporate both urban and rural land use dynamics. And again, um, has a component to integrate some stakeholder decision-making models. So um, hopefully this model will help move the conversation along, alongside all the other great work presented at this conference this week. So thank you for your time. Oh, that's great, Carolyn. And I, you know, I missed sending Carolyn the chat for two minutes. So she's really done a great job of bringing this in on time. Thank you. Um, uh, and amazing, um, amazing the number of the factors that you're bringing in and lots of questions um, on, um, you know, inter potential interactions with users of the decision support tool and so forth. So through the so Donovan. Sure. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yeah, lots of great questions. I mean, I think the, the summary of my answers would be, uh, yes, it's way more complicated than we portrayed it in 12 minutes. Um, that's <laughs> how life is. Um, there's a lot of other factors that are going into this. I think for us, the you know the impetus for this was really talking to local governments on uh, Long Island and New Jersey, and just having them be so um, you know knee jerk against this of even having conversations about managed retreat, because I think as Richard Norton pointed out in the chat, there you know there's this there's this common perception that there's a huge tax base implication. And I just wanted to try to quantify that a little bit, both the upfront and downstream costs. And I think, you know, I think the short answer for a lot of these things is, um, you know, we need to do more planning. Hempstead is doing none. So 
if this does happen in the future, they're really going to be stuck flat footed. There's also such an aversion to development, to more dense development and development at all uh, on Long Island and also to some degree in New Jersey that this is a challenge, right? I mean, where are people going to go? They're going to go somewhere else and that's going to have an implication for the tax base. And then, you know, the other thing I'm really interested in in general is regional planning. And I think, you know, as has been mentioned in this session already, that's something we have to get much better about doing in this country as well is thinking regionally and not in these little tiny boxes, because those little tiny boxes are just going to cease to exist if they can't figure out how to cooperate with their neighbors. So um, those are just some kind of quick overview thoughts to some of the chat questions. Great, Donovan. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. Uh, obviously, it, you know, your presentation really struck a chord with a lot of people. Um, I noticed in the chat that there's a, a little bit of an exchange between Kelsey and Robert Nichols on uh, questions related to, partly related to attribution. Um, Kelsey, I don't know if you want to just uh, speak briefly to that. Yeah, so I think the question was around how do we really um, attribute an event or a risk to climate change versus you know just the norm and i don't have a great answer i think it's a really valuable question and um you know donovan mentioned this question of scale so for my own work i do want to kind of zoom in the scale a bit more and get into the details you know right now it's really five thousand feet um big picture view but part of that would be you know, we started talking about perceptions of climate change as well and getting some of the human decision elements into the work. So I think it's um, a really important question and, you know, one I'm still thinking through. Great, thanks, Kelsey. Um, it looks like Fernando got a question um, that may have been offline. Um, uh, Fernando, I don't know if you want to reflect briefly on that. because I didn't see the question, actual question in the chat, or maybe I'm just missing it. Yes, uh, well, the, the more important part was about the Martin Peña project, which is a very long lived project, uh, but unfortunately has a master plan that's a bit dated. It's not taking care at addressing uh, the increase in ocean level rise. Um, the thing about these projects is that there is a confluence between poor people, disadvantaged people, communities, and fragile territories. And that is one of the more complex issues then to, to tackle. OK, um, great. Thank you. Um, and then I guess we have one more here, a question to Caroline, um, which uh, for, also from Robert Nichols. If I push you over what time scale um, would you think the model is useful to inform policy? Um, 10 years, 20 years, and so on. But, I mean, it can, it can be useful at multiple timescales. And I think um, what's unique about it is incorporating like annual time steps. There's other models that look largely at like decadal changes. Um, I mean, there's lots of discussion about the 30 year mortgage and things should be centered at a 30 year time scale and so on. But I think there's advantages in both looking at kind of like annual changes when you can perhaps change a budget or uh, change zoning in certain areas and looking at the changes over multiple scales and uh, in the long term, or just looking, okay, here we are today, what's it going to look like 30 years from now and um, framing planning discussions around that. So I don't know. <laughs> Since I'm near and dear to this project, I think it's useful for multiple scales, but I, of course, like uh, open to debate and, and so on. It, it's just a tool. It's one of many tools that we can start the conversations. Yeah, do you plan any kind of evaluation, um, you know, working with different types of decision makers to see what their reactions are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a workshop about a year and a half, well, no, two years ago, um, getting preliminary thoughts from um, government officials, both state and local, or state, local, I think there are some FEMA folks there as well, um, as also, also some um, developers and folks involved in the real estate um, dynamics as well. Um, okay. So yeah. yeah, it's part of a, an evolving discussion. 
Great. Well, thank you. Listen, I want to thank all the speakers and all of you who've participated. I think that, you know, one of the things I've taken away is that we really are um, in need of more social learning um, from one another and looking at our projects across the, you know, not just at individual projects, but across them to really figure out where we are in the process of dealing with this incredibly complex and even chaotic problem. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, great to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.